Hi, welcome to Hub Bytes. I'm Sunil Rege, consultant psychiatrist. Today I'll be taking you through the presentation on understanding schizophrenia or psychosis. And what I'm going to be doing is to be linking the neurobiology to the clinical features. Schizophrenia as a label doesn't really allow us to think about the patient holistically. So what we're going to try to do is to deconstruct the condition using neurobiology to understand how to look at clinical features in a more comprehensive manner. In order to understand schizophrenia, the predominant hypothesis has been the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia. So let's understand how dopamine metabolism and production works. We know that dopamine is produced from tyrosine and tyrosine comes from phenyl alanine which is essentially an amino acid that we take through diet. Now tyrosine gets converted to dopa and dopa gets converted to dopamine and this happens to through two enzymes tyrosine hydroxylase is the first step and then dopa decarboxylase and then the dopamine gets packaged into vesicles and these vesicles then release dopamine into the synaptic cleft so essentially the entire pathway looks like this tyrosine to dopa dopa to dopamine then packaged in vesicles and then released into the synaptic cleft. Now we know that there are several receptors of dopamine, D1 all the way to D5. And when dopamine binds to the receptors, the neurons fire. So let's look at the dopamine pathways in the brain. The key areas that we are focusing on are firstly the areas from which dopamine neurons arise and where dopamine is produced. So we have the substantia nigra and tegmentum, which is the ventral tegmental area. Now these two areas are the predominant areas where dopamine neurons are situated. And from these areas, there are projections to different parts of the brain and dopamine then serves the respective functions. The other area that we need to think about is the hypothalamus and then the basal ganglia. So based on the connections of the dopamine neurons to the different parts of the brain, we have different pathways. The mesolimbic dopamine pathway. Next, the nigrostriatal dopamine pathway, which connects the substantia nigra to the basal ganglia. Then the mesocortical dopamine pathway. And finally, the tubera infundibula dopamine pathway. So let's look at each of these pathways and how they're responsible for clinical symptoms and what clinical features are they related to? So first one, the mesolimbic pathway is, arises from the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens. And the nucleus accumbens, as we know, mediates reward. So this area is responsible not only for the reward pathway, but also where the positive symptoms arise. The next pathway is the ventral tegmental area to the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and this is responsible for mood. The next pathway is the ventral tegmental area to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and this pathway, the mesocortical pathway, is linked to cognition but also negative symptoms. Then we have the substantia nigra connections to the striatum in the basal ganglia and this is responsible for movements. Then we have the hypothalamic connections to the anterior pituitary that controls prolactin secretion, the lactating hormone. And finally, it's very important to think about the metabolic syndrome. So although we're not specifically looking at any pathways here uh, regulated by dopamine, when we think about a patient with schizophrenia, it is helpful to deconstruct the picture into these pathways so that we can examine these pathways independently. So very quickly, we look at the mesolimbic pathway, which is responsible for the positive symptoms, but is also the reward pathway. Next is the mesocortical pathway to the ventromedial prefrontal cortex that is responsible for affective symptoms or mood symptoms. Then the ventral, ventral tegmental area to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, again part of the mesocortical pathway, is responsible for cognition and negative symptoms. Then we have substantia nigra to the striatum, which is the nigrostriatal pathway responsible for 
movements. And then we have the tubera in fundibular pathway, the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary is mediates the prolactin secretion. And then at the back of our mind, we should always think about metabolic syndrome because individuals with psychosis, schizophrenia are inherently predisposed to developing metabolic dysfunction. This will affect the choice of medication. So therefore one can think about the phenotype of schizophrenia in the form of positive symptoms, delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, disorganized behavior, agitation, and in extreme cases, catatonia. But one should also think about the negative symptoms arising from the, dors the mesocortical pathway linked to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, elogia, a volition, blunted affect, anhedonia, and asociality. Elogia is linked to speech, a volition is linked to movement or motivation. One can also think about the localization of schizophrenia symptoms in the following way, positive symptoms arising from the mesolimbic pathway, negative symptoms from the mesocortical pathway, cognitive symptoms, again, the mesocortical pathway of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, aggressive symptoms or agitation can arise from the orbitofrontal cortex and affective symptoms of the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And therefore, now if we connect the DSM-5 criteria for schizophrenia, we can see that these are the symptoms that are included in DSM-5 um, criteria. So, of course, these symptoms, two or more of the following, are present for at least a significant period of time for one month. And at least one of these should be either delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech. So you can see the positive symptoms are quite significant, but it's important to think about the other ones which are negative symptoms as well, as this is a core part of schizophrenia. And of course, this, these symptoms impacting on functioning in areas of work, interpersonal relationships or self-care is part of the disorder. You can read more about this um, in on the Psych Scene Hub where we have the schizophrenia diagnostic interview. We also have a range of questions that you can ask specifically to ascertain auditory hallucinations, for example, to ascertain negative symptoms, uh, to ascertain thought disorder, uh, etc. So please do have a read on the Psych Scene Hub. Now, the important thing is we know that when medications are prescribed, most of the medications are antipsychotic medications. Now, antipsychotic medications block the dopamine receptor, the D2 receptor. Now, we will cover the detail, the psychopharmacology of antipsychotics in another video, but briefly what happens is when we block the mesolimbic dopamine pathway, then we treat positive symptoms. And that's what we want to do in schizophrenia. We want to treat the positive symptoms. So it's blocking D2 in the mesolimbic dopamine pathway. However, the dopamine blockade in other areas can create issues, can create side effects. So what can happen is, if we block the dopamine receptor in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the pathway from the ventral tegmental area to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, that is the mesocortical pathway, then we can create executive functioning deficits, cognitive deficits. If we block the dopamine in the mesocortical pathway to the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, the patient can have a blunted affect or may develop secondary negative symptoms or secondary depressive, depressive symptoms. If we block the dopamine in the nigrostriatal pathway the quite prominently, then it can result in extrapyramidal side effects. If we block the dopamine pathway significantly in the tubera in fundibular pathway, then it can lead to increased prolactin levels. And we know that increased prolactin can be associated with mood issues, long-term osteoporosis, galactorrhea, amenorrhea, and of course, um, drop in libido or sexual dysfunction. So it's important to think about prolactin as well. So, we know that what antipsychotics try to do, the newer generation antipsychotic medications, the second generation ones, and of course we'll talk about partial agonists in another video, but essentially by blocking, so they combine the D2 receptor and then when they use the 5-HT2A antagonism, then they attempt to reverse the effects that we saw in the earlier slides, is they increase dopamine in those pathways, thus minimizing 
side effects. So we know that we saw in SSRI, when we looked at psychopharmacology of SSRIs, that when we activate the 5-HD2A receptor, it results in frontal decreased dopamine, and that's why SSRIs can result in some EPSEs, at times akathisia, but also emotional blunting. The same thing is if we block that receptor, the 5-HD2 receptor, 2A receptor, then we can increase dopamine. The other hypothesis is, of course, the glutamate pathways. Now, the glutamate pathways, there are a range of pathways. However, the key thing we've got to remember is that when, there's, when glutamate's activated, it's an excitatory neurotransmitter. It stimulates the NMDA receptors, which releases GABA, and GABA inhibits dopamine. So what it does is it prevents excessive release of dopamine in the brain. However, in schizophrenia, there is the hypofunctioning NMDA receptor hypothesis. So what tends to happen is when these NMDA receptors are hypofunctioning, it actually decreases the release of GABA, and therefore there's increased dopamine in the mesolimbic system, which can result in increased um, psychotic symptoms or positive symptoms. And that's the NMDA hypothesis of schizophrenia, which is the hypofunctioning NMDA receptor hypothesis. So let me show you some examples of side effects. So you can see here, this is someone with a pill rolling tremor. It's telling me that there is dopamine blockade in the nigrostriatal pathway. If we look at this one, what I'm doing here is using the Luria three-step test, which is fist edge palm, but I don't tell the patient fist edge palm. And you can see that the sequencing is difficult for this patient. and there's a tremor as the patient's trying to do it, this is telling me that the patient's likely having dopamine blockade in the mesocortical pathway that is connecting the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And therefore, the patient's executive function, which is set sequencing in this case through the Luria three-step test, is affected. This is a really good test to examine frontal lobe functioning. You can read more about frontal lobe functioning on the psych scene hub. This is a patient where you can see this is an involuntary movement of the legs. The patient's experiencing akathisia. So this is telling me again that the dopamine's blocked significantly in the uh, nigrostriatal pathway leading to extrapyramidal side effects, in this case akathisia. Akathisia, there is a range of mechanisms, not just dopamine blockade but it's telling me that the patient's um, nigrostriatal pathway is affected. Now, of course, it's important in akathisia to ask the patient as to whether there is a subjective sense of restlessness. In this case, the patient had both subjective sense of restlessness and objective, as we saw in the video. So the important thing here um, to leave you with is that when we look at schizophrenia, as Plato said, the greatest mistake in the treatment of diseases is that there are physicians for the body and physicians for the soul, although the two cannot be separated. So although we think about the psychological aspects, it's important to think about the nigrostriatal pathway, the physical manifestations of the illness and the medications that we prescribe, and also metabolic side effects. So connect the mind and body. And finally, Medicine is learned by the bedside and not in the classroom. Let not your conceptions of disease come from words heard in the lecture room or read from the book. See, then reason, compare and control, but see first. So I hope this is something that you found useful. Um, visit the Psych Scene Hub for more detail. Uh, take care and stay safe.